Hi, Betty. Um, so I wanted to hear about why you're so passionate about including conversations around racism in your crime and chemistry class. I grew up in the South in the 50s and the 60s during the civil rights movement. I was in college during the civil rights movement. I saw everything that was happening at that time. When I was six years old, my parents, my grandparents had a woman who came and helped her around the house. And she had a small son about my age, Timmy. And Timmy and I played together. We had the greatest time together. We would sit and color, color books together. We would read books together. We would run outside and play tag. One day I asked my mother why Timmy's skin was different from mine, and I never saw Timmy again. His mother still came, but Timmy never did. I was really confused about that, and nobody could really explain to me why. I went to high school when it was integrated, and I made the mistake. I didn't make the mistake. Everybody else told me I made a mistake, but I sat next to a black student on the bus going to the school. And I got called every kind of name you can imagine for having a white girl sitting next to a black boy on the school bus. Went through all of that, went through college, Vietnam, the civil rights, everything. I lived in a predominantly black neighborhood when I was working in Virginia. And um, I never really felt any fear because I was white. Even though most of the people around me were black, I was white. I never felt any problems with it. We moved to Pittsburgh and I went, whoa, there are some problems here. Uh, because I saw racism running rampant in Pittsburgh, although Pittsburgh never would admit it. I saw it happening. And then I started teaching the chemistry and crime class. And teaching chemistry and crime opened up a whole new world for me because I looked at how police misconduct with African Americans, how or people of color, would cause all sorts of problems. Either they would die or they would wind up in court and convicted. I saw how everything was skewed towards whites being okay, people of color not. Mm -hmm. And it really upset me. And I'm looking at my predominantly white class going, why aren't you upset? I want you to see this. I want you to figure out what's going on. And I want to try to teach you where the differences are. What about you, Lyndon? So um, I grew up in, in the North. Um, and I grew up in a racially integrated family. My youngest brother was Lakota Sioux, adopted right before we moved to uh, suburban Indiana and into a very, very white community. And two of my strongest memories of living in suburban Indiana were the racism that my brother was experiencing um, that spilled over into my family. One was the little boys riding their bikes up and down the street in front of our house asking where the little red N word was. Um, and the other was being refused entry to a swim organization. And both my brothers were very strong swimmers. And that was a period of time when swimming was king in, in, uh, in Indiana. And having the uh, swim center withdraw their invitation because they hadn't realized that Native American skin got so dark in the summertime. <laughs> um, and because I'd grown up in a racially mixed family, I had always assumed that, of course, I wasn't racist. So I was really shocked when I took the implicit bias test about six years ago or so and tested as being biased against Blacks. And after I passed through the denial, um, I realized that this gave me an opportunity to really interrogate my internal monologue. And when I started doing that, I realized that my internal monologue was indeed racist, or at least racist on occasion. And I realized the strength of having that recognition meant that I could 
then monitor my thinking and my behavior and become actively non-racist and actively anti-racist. And about that same time, I started teaching the forensics class. And like you, I teach at a predominantly white institution. Um, most, the vast majority of students in the room are white. And I have no tools, I had no tools for working with them. I could teach them the forensics, I could teach them about the um, overt racism of our criminal justice system, but I could ask them to take the implicit bias test and to reflect on it, but I had no tools for have, monitoring and rent, uh, working with them to help them work with the information they were getting. And so this summer, uh, triggered by all the action that's taking place, I joined a book group reading Tatum's Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? And there's a chapter in that on the experiences that Tatum, who's a professor, a psychology professor, teaching at predominantly white institutions, she's black, um, has on the patterns, the cognitive development patterns that she's seen in her white students. And I realized this is a tool that we should bring to censor because it will give all of us the opportunity to work through this. And so we, Betty and I have designed this workshop, not because we have any answers, but because we wanna have the conversation and see if we can together find ways to help white students work with the emotional distress of the reality of US systemic racism. Exactly. I mean, you are uncomfortable with it. I'm uncomfortable with it. Let's make other people uncomfortable with it. Work <laughs> through it and see what we can come up with. So we hope to see you. <laughs>